the man known to history as King Henry I of England was most likely born in England around 1068, though the exact circumstances of his birth are not precisely known today. His father was William of Normandy, the Duke of Normandy in northern France, a territory which had evolved out of the Norse Principality that had been established there by the Viking leader Rollo in the early 10th century. Consequently, Henry was of partial Norse or Norman descent and of French blood. His father had been Duke of Normandy for many years, but beginning in 1066, he had begun the conquest of England and subsequent ascent to the position of king. Thus, it seems that Henry was born in Britain shortly after the Norman conquest commenced. Henry's mother was Matilda of Flanders, the daughter of Baldwin V, Count of Flanders, a major principality to the east of Normandy in what is now Belgium. She had married William in the early 1050s, and together they had eight children, four sons and four daughters. Henry was the youngest of the eight. Because he had three older brothers, Robert, born around 1051, Richard, born shortly after Robert, and William Rufus, born around 1056, it was extremely unlikely that Henry would succeed his father as a major ruler of the family's principalities. Although the death of Richard in 1070 or 1071 during a hunting accident in the New Forest in southern England did increase the chances of Henry playing a significant role in the politics of England and Normandy at some future date. Henry's life would be shaped by events which were already underway when he was born. His father had been Duke of Normandy since 1035 when Henry's grandfather, Robert, had died prematurely. At that time, William was only a child, and it was not until after a lengthy power struggle with his own nobles and rivals for the dukedom that William had eventually secured his rule over Normandy around 1060. An effective feudal overlord, William was eager to expand his realms even further, and an opportunity soon presented itself from across the English Channel where the King of England, Edward the Confessor, did not have an heir. When Edward eventually died in the first days of 1066, his brother-in-law, Harold Godwinson, succeeded him, but his claim to the throne was weak and he soon faced rival claims. One of these came from Henry's father, who had visited England in 1051 and claimed that Edward had offered him his throne after he died at that time. Accordingly, William invaded southern England in the autumn of 1066 and swiftly defeated Harold at the Battle of Hastings. A brutal policy of conquest was pursued in the years that followed, with William's Norman knights completely overthrowing the old Anglo-Saxon and Danish aristocracy across England. This Norman conquest was still underway when Henry was born. What is notable is that once it was complete, William would rule his French possessions separately from his English holdings. Indeed, he spent much of his later years, even after conquering England, in France. It was also relatively clear from an early date that he intended to divide his territories when it came to passing them to his sons. It was not assumed that Robert, as his father's eldest surviving son, would succeed as both King of England and Duke of Normandy. Our sources for Henry's life and times are relatively plentiful by comparison with those for many other monarchs of medieval Europe. The foremost account is provided by Orderic Vitalis, an English Benedictine monk and historical chronicler who was a contemporary of Henry's having been born in 1075. His Historia Ecclesiastica, or Ecclesiastical History, provides an account of English history which is heavily focused on the Norman Conquest and the subsequent period through the rule of William and his sons. A near contemporary of Vitalis's William of Malmesbury composed numerous works and is generally deemed to be the most significant historian writing in Europe in the 12th century. His accounts of church history and the conflicts within England provide a great insight into Henry's reign. Both Orderic Vitalis and William of Malmesbury are usually deemed to have been relatively objective and accurate historians, and as such, we have relatively reliable sources with which to evaluate Henry's life and reign. Others, such as the theologian and church figure Edmer, were more biased owing to a dispute within the English church during the 12th century concerning an argument over whether the Archbishop of Canterbury or of York had primacy within the English Church. These are supplemented by a wide range of administrative records, such as royal charters, 
church records and pipe rolls, all of a kind that is simply unavailable for the periods prior to the Norman conquest of England. As the uncertainty surrounding his place and time of birth would suggest, there is a frustrating lack of evidence about Henry's early life. There is, for instance, a debate amongst historians of the period over whether Henry was primarily raised and educated in England or in Normandy. The latter seems more likely, given that his father continued to view himself primarily as a French lord and the family ancestral seat was in northern France. Wherever he was raised, it is quite likely that he had little relationship with his two surviving older brothers, Robert and William Rufus, during his childhood, as their significant age gap of between 12 and 17 years ensured that Robert and William were beginning to aid their father in ruling England and Normandy, while Henry was still a child. This estrangement from his brothers is significant for later events as it holds out the possibility that their fraternal bonds were not strong. Henry was most likely educated by Osmond, Bishop of Salisbury, and was possibly being trained for a life as a prominent church figure, a typical role for a younger son of a king such as himself. As a result, he was probably better educated than his father, with an ability to read and write Latin and some scholarly training of a kind which William the Conqueror cannot be said to have had. This aside, it is now believed by historians that the cognomen which late medieval chroniclers later gave Henry, Beauclerc, meaning that he was well-educated, was probably excessive, and while Henry was more learned than his father and other ancestors, he was no scholar king. His father knighted him in May 1086, when Henry was probably around 18 years of age. William the Conqueror's knighting of his youngest son was one of his last significant acts that we know of. He died not much more than a year later, on the 9th of September 1087, after sustaining injuries while campaigning militarily in the Vexin in France. Henry attended on his father at Rouen and Normandy before he died. There, the dying king decided on the succession. Although primogeniture, the concept that the firstborn son of a monarch or lord should succeed him, emerged eventually to be paramount in Norman culture and across much of Europe, this principle was not firmly in place by the late 11th century. Moreover, the fact that William's two main territories, the Kingdom of England and the Duchy of Normandy, were two different polities ensured that it was very plausible that one of his sons would become King of England and another Duke of Normandy. This is exactly what the Conqueror decided on. He bestowed the Duchy of Normandy on Robert as the eldest son and the Kingdom of England on William Rufus. While this arrangement had the benefit of William being able to claim he was bestowing his patrimony, the Duchy of Normandy, which he had inherited from his own father, on Robert as the eldest son, William was effectively favouring William Rufus in making him King of England, as he preferred his second eldest son. Henry, as the youngest, was left out of this arrangement, as expected, but he was compensated with extensive estates in Buckinghamshire and Gloucestershire in England, and a large sum of money. Robert was unwilling to accept his father's dispensation, and war followed between him and William Rufus immediately following the Conqueror's death. Henry was soon drawn into this. He decided to remain in Normandy, and his presence there effectively ensured that he would ally with Robert against William Rufus. Robert needed access to the money which their father had bestowed on Henry to help him raise additional military forces, and, on top of this, William Rufus drove Henry into their elder brother's camp when he quickly confiscated Henry's estates that he had been granted in Buckinghamshire and Gloucestershire in England. Faced with this situation, Henry began negotiating with Robert. An agreement was soon reached whereby Henry would ally with Robert and provide him with financing and the support of Henry's allies and followers. But perhaps most importantly, Robert agreed to bestow some of his lands in northern France on Henry. Specifically, the Cotentin Peninsula region, also known today as the Cherbourg Peninsula, in Normandy on the northwest coast of modern-day France. Here, Henry would have the title of Count of the Cotentin, and while he would be nominally answerable to Robert as Duke of Normandy, Henry would effectively have his own patrimony. Thus, the war which immediately broke out between Robert and William Rufus following their father's death benefited Henry substantially. Unfortunately, Henry's time as Count of the Cotentin would be short-lived. 
Although the first year or so of his rule there allowed him to begin building up a strong power base of supporters in Western Normandy, west into Brittany, he was challenged by many figures, not least the powerful Bishop of Bayeux, Odo, who managed to undermine Henry by convincing Robert that his younger brother was secretly conspiring with William Rufus. A brief trip by Henry to England to try to convince William that he should allow him to hold the estates which had once belonged to their mother in England, she having died several years earlier, did nothing to assuage Robert's fears that Henry was in fact conspiring with William. And so, when he returned to northern France in the autumn of 1088, he was detained by Odo's forces. Robert took back possession of the Cotentin, which he had only recently granted to Henry, though he soon set Henry at liberty. Thus, Henry found himself blundering to some extent as the 1090s dawned, and as his two older brothers continued to wage war against each other across the English Channel. The rivalry between Robert and William Rufus continued into the early 1090s. In 1091, William Rufus invaded Normandy, though this foray soon turned completely against Henry as William and Robert came to an agreement whereby Robert would accept William's position as King of England in return for aid in helping Robert to re-establish control over Normandy and his other lands in northern France against fractious lords such as Henry. Thus, Henry found himself challenged by both his brothers in 1091, a scenario which led him to retreat southwards into the Vexin region of France. There, he waited for a new falling out between William Rufus and Robert, which duly followed in 1092. Henry now determined to ally with William against Robert and fixed his mast to the King of England's from 1092 onwards. In this way, he was able to expand his own power base in northern France and gradually began to seize control of parts of Normandy with his brother's aid from Robert. Henry's growing power was facilitated in 1095 when Robert elected to take the cross and to journey to the Holy Land as part of the First Crusade. With this, Henry began establishing himself as the preeminent power in Normandy, with William ruling England. The alliance between the two brothers held for the remainder of the 1090s, and together they re-established the family's control over much of northern France. Henry might have remained a prominent lord in northern France, or perhaps a falling out would have resulted eventually between himself and William Rufus, but in the end, events overtook both of them. On the 2nd of April 1100, while hunting in the new forest near Brockenhurst, the same vast forest where their older brother Richard had died three decades earlier in a hunting accident, William Rufus was shot through the chest with an arrow that seems to have been unleashed accidentally by a minor noble named Walter Tyrrell. There was not much by way of decorum in the moments that followed, the king's body was seemingly left lying on the ground as the members of William's party fled the scene in haste to plot the succession. William had not married or had children, and it seems plausible that he was gay. It also seems plausible that Henry had decided to capitalize on William's lack of a successor and Robert's continued absence while on crusade by having William murdered in the New Forest and making it seem like an accident. We will never know the truth of this, but what we do know is that Henry and his followers moved quickly to secure the royal residences and the English treasury at Winchester. He was quickly proclaimed as King Henry I of England in succession to his brother. Only then was William Rufus's body recovered from the New Forest and sent to Winchester Cathedral for burial. Henry was now King of England, but Robert would not accept this lightly. As William the Conqueror's eldest son, he had already been passed over for the throne of England once. He did not intend to let Henry's seeming usurpation of the crown go unchallenged. At the time of William's death, Robert was on his way back across Europe from the Holy Land, the First Crusade having ended in absolute triumph in the summer of 1099 with the capture of Jerusalem from the Muslim occupants. With this, Robert headed home. When he reached France, he publicly professed his claim to the throne of England in spite of the fact that Henry had been crowned at Westminster on the 5th of August 1100, just three days after William Rufus's death. However, not all accepted Henry's coronation, and with Robert's return, a new war would ensue between the two remaining sons of William the Conqueror to see who would now claim the throne of the kingdom 
that the Normans had conquered just over three decades earlier. Henry's opening gambit in this new conflict was to negotiate a marriage alliance with the King of Scotland, Malcolm III, by marrying Malcolm's daughter, Matilda. This was a judicious move for multiple reasons. Firstly, it ensured that, if Henry was going to have to wage a war against his brother across the English Channel, his northern flank would not be attacked by the Scots. Instead, he would be able to call on aid from England's northern neighbour. Secondly, Matilda's mother was Margaret of Wessex, a scion of the Anglo-Saxon royal house of Wessex. Consequently, in marrying Matilda, Henry was marrying into the noble line of England and cementing his claim to the throne, and particularly the claim which any child born of his and Matilda's marriage would have. It was also well past time for Henry, as a man in his early thirties, to marry and produce a legitimate heir. Thus it was that on the 11th of November 1100, just three months after his proclamation and coronation as king, that Henry married Matilda in Westminster Abbey. As we will see, their marriage became problematic as the years went by, owing to a dearth of children. Within months of his marriage to Matilda, there was also the possibility of peace with Robert. The clash between Henry and his brother appeared to come to something of a conclusion in 1101, when the two feuding brothers agreed to peace terms through the Treaty of Alton. Named after the town of Alton in Hampshire, in the south of England, where the pair met that year to work out an agreement whereby they could end the conflict between them. Through the treaty, Robert agreed to acknowledge Henry as the King of England in succession to William Rufus, in return for a wide range of concessions. Firstly, Robert would be paid a significant yearly stipend of 3,000 marks out of the English treasury to compensate him for relinquishing any claims to England's crown revenues and estate. Henry also relinquished nearly all of his claims to the family's lands in France though he would retain a small estate there for when he visited Normandy. As neither of the two brothers as yet had a legitimate male heir to succeed them, both agreed at Alton that if they died, the other would succeed them to their lands. This latter point opened the door for future conflicts, as it would place whichever brother produced a male heir first in an advantageous position. Nevertheless, the Treaty of Alton briefly held out the prospect of peace between the two brothers, with Henry ruling England and Robert controlling Normandy. In the aftermath of the Treaty of Alton, Henry began demoting a number of senior nobles and church figures who had been stalwarts of the English church and aristocracy since his father's time. Men like Robert de Belaine and William de Warren, Earl of Surrey, whose loyalty Henry viewed as suspect. He promoted others in their stead, and this policy of the promotion of new men, individuals who had not held senior ecclesiastical positions, noble titles, or government office during the reigns of his father or elder brother, but who Henry promoted to replace more well-established political and religious figures, became a common feature of his reign. Orderic Vitalis testified to this in his Historia Ecclesiastica, stating that Henry, quote, pulled down many great men from positions of eminence and sentenced them to be disinherited. On the other hand, he ennobled others of base stock who had served him well, raised them, so to say, from the dust, and heaping all kinds of favours on them, stationed them above earls and famous constables. Witnesses of the truth of my words are Geoffrey de Clinton, Ralph Bassett, Hugh of Buckland, Wilgrip Rayner of Bath, William Trusbert, Hamo of Falaise, Wigan Algerson, Robert of Bostair, and many others who have heaped up riches and built lavishly on a scale far beyond the means of their fathers. Witnesses, too, are the men who, on trumped-up and unjust pretexts, have been oppressed by them. The king raised to high rank all of these and many others of low birth whom it would be tedious to name individually, lifted them out of insignificance by his royal authority, set them on the summit of power, and made them formidable even to the greatest magnates of the kingdom. Orderic Vitalis' assertions are supported by other contemporary or near-contemporary accounts of Henry's reign, and there is little doubt that he did engage in such behaviour. Geoffrey de Clinton was perhaps the most prominent of these. Although he started the reign as a minor landholder and official in the late 1110s, he gained the trust of the king and when Herbert Camerarius, the royal treasurer, fell from favour in 1118, 
Henry promoted Jeffrey to be the equivalent of his Minister for Finance. De Clinton also benefited enormously in terms of land and wealth, acquiring large estates through royal largesse, particularly in Warwickshire, where he began construction of Kenilworth Castle. Another of those who Vitalis mentioned, Ralph Bassett, was a legal officer who was born in Normandy. Henry plucked him from relative obscurity shortly after his accession and made him one of England and Normandy's most senior judges, a position which he held for a quarter of a century. Many others were promoted in this way, often at the expense of families who had prospered under Henry's father and brother. Yet it was not highly incongruous or inappropriate for Henry to act in this way. Medieval monarchs often promoted their allies to senior government positions and to act as their representatives as landholders in the provinces. For a king like Henry, who had struggled to assert himself within his family and faced continuing threats from his brother, it was simply wise to promote his allies in this way. Nevertheless, there is no doubt that the phenomenon of the new men, as 19th century historians termed them, created resentments towards Henry in many circles and coloured opinions concerning his reign. The terms of the peace between Henry and Robert, which were negotiated and agreed upon at Alton, did not last long. In the course of 1102 and early 1103, Henry managed to strengthen his alliance network in northern France and began preparing for a fresh move against Robert. For his part, Robert was unable to control many of his nobles in Normandy. This was one of the major underlying causes of the conflicts which ensued for 20 years after William the Conqueror's death. As his eldest son, Robert viewed himself as a rightful ruler of some of the family's dominions, but he was a weak, ineffectual ruler who could never gain the loyalty of the Norman nobles. Indeed, an anecdote related by Orderic Vitalis in his History of the Time relates how Robert was supposed to hear an Easter sermon given by the Bishop of Sais, Serlo, in 1105, but could not attend because he got drunk the night beforehand and awoke to find that some of his followers had stolen his clothes. This is hardly indicative of a ruler who inspired the respect of his subjects. It was this poor leadership which fermented much of the conflict between him and Henry and William Rufus earlier. Accordingly, Henry invaded Normandy in 1104 and again in 1105, demonstrating to his older brother that he would continue to undermine his position so long as Robert showed that he was vulnerable. Ultimately, these clashes came to a climax in 1106, when Henry launched a fresh foray across the English Channel. On this occasion, his campaign focused on efforts to seize the castle of Tanchebray in Normandy. Robert eventually elected to meet him here on the field in open battle. The Battle of Tanchebray, which was fought on the 28th of September 1106, would finally bring the conflicts between the sons of William the Conqueror, which had started following his death nearly two decades earlier, to an end. Estimates of the size of medieval armies are notoriously difficult to determine with accuracy owing to the medieval chronicler's tendency to exaggerate or minimize the size of armies depending on which side they wanted to extol the martial virtues of. But it is generally agreed that Henry and Robert had forces of relatively equal size at Tanchebray, perhaps between 6,000 and 7,000 men each, though Henry probably had a numerical advantage in terms of cavalry which gave him an edge when the two brothers met that autumn day. And yet, the English king allegedly ordered his knights to dismount, and the battle became primarily an infantry engagement. Henry's forces attacked in two wings, led by William, Count of Evreux, with a third detachment in reserve. In the end, it was the utilization of the reserve force which broke Robert's lines and ended in a rout, with Henry's forces emerging victorious after an hour of clashes. By the time the Battle of Tanchebray ended, hundreds of Robert's men lay dead or severely wounded, but the truly conclusive element to the battle was in the capture of many of Robert's senior nobles and the Duke himself. With his brother's detention, Henry was finally in a position to end the conflict between the pair and to fully unite the Kingdom of England and the Duchy of Normandy under the sole rule of a son of William the Conqueror. Henry's response to this position of power was ruthless, and is in part the explanation for his later reputation for cruelty. He had Robert taken to England and imprisoned in Devizes Castle in Wiltshire, a fortress erected during their father's time in the English countryside. Then Henry had himself proclaimed as Duke of Normandy, 
uniting England and the Norman territories in northern France under his sole rule. Robert would be kept under house arrest in Devizes Castle for the next 20 years, only being moved in the mid-1120s to Cardiff Castle as a precautionary measure during a period when Henry faced a revolt in France from Robert's adult son. He would then live out the remaining years of his life in the Welsh fortress. He eventually died in February 1134, an old man well into his 80s at that time. It was perhaps a cruel dispensation which Henry elected to adopt for his brother, but perhaps Robert had brought it on himself in his unwillingness to accept anyone else as his father's rightful successor. In any event, it had the desired result. From 1106 onwards, following Tanchebray and Robert's imprisonment, peace of a sort finally prevailed in England and Normandy, which were united under Henry's sole rule after decades of conflict. With the end of the fraternal war between Henry and Robert, Henry was at last free to begin ruling his territories as a peacetime monarch. Like all monarchs during the High Middle Ages, Henry had to govern through his nobles and senior church figures, a necessity at a time when government bureaucracy was limited and the tentacles of the state were short. As such, ruling at this time was as much about managing the feudal lords, who in turn administered individual parts of the realm, as exercising strong kingship from the centre. As we have seen, Henry did so in large part by promoting his allies to positions of unprecedented power and replacing older nobles and officials who had first risen under either his father or brother. Often, he could be brutal in this, severely punishing recalcitrant barons and earls who refused to bend to his will, and this has added to his reputation for cruelty and to the controversy surrounding the new men in his own time and ever since. Yet, it was effective. By the 1110s, Henry had succeeded in establishing a stable, well-governed kingdom which was more at peace than any time since the last years of his father's reign. At the heart of this was the royal household, or Domus. This was the forerunner of the later medieval and early modern royal courts. The household consisted not just of the king and his family, but senior officials and church figures, as well as a substantial retinue of troops to guard the king and the royal family. By the time Henry claimed the throne of England, a series of royal palaces were already emerging as the locations in which the royal court was located. These included Westminster and Woodstock Palace in Oxfordshire, though many of the most famous English royal palaces and castles, such as those at Windsor and Buckingham, were the products of later centuries. In addition to his residence at Woodstock or in Rouen when in France, Henry would often travel around England and Normandy with a cohort of civil and ecclesiastical lawyers in train, dispensing justice. This was the forerunner of the sessions of Assize, which, in turn, would be replaced in time by circuit courts. What all of this achieved was a system whereby the new hybrid Anglo-Norman laws could be enforced in the regions, giving Henry's subjects access to the tenets of royal justice. Two issues above all others were the most important in his governance of his realms. The first was taxation. The groundwork for effective taxation of England by the new Norman overlords had been laid down towards the end of William the Conqueror's reign when the Doomsday Book, a record of landholders and other individuals across England, was produced. However, the crown taxation system was clearly further developed by Henry and his officials. Revenues were paid into the Exchequer, which was kept in Winchester. The first systematic records for these payments date to Henry's reign. These are called the Pipe Rolls, or Great Rolls of the Pipe, so named because the parchment on which they were produced was rolled up when not in use and resembled a pipe when rolled in this way. These audited the accounts of taxes collected submitted by the sheriffs of each locality and essentially contained a record of the royal revenue from taxation. The first such Pipe Roll to have survived from the 12th century dates to 1130, towards the end of Henry's reign, but it is clear from this particular set of accounts that it was not the first one ever produced and pipe rolls were produced earlier in Henry's reign, which have unfortunately not survived down to the present day. What is significant about this is that these were the first concerted efforts at recording the amount of taxes which were being collected on a yearly basis and as such are some of the first records in medieval Europe which presaged the development of a national exchequer. Henry's role in implementing such a system was significant. 
The other major issue which taxed Henry was the church. By the 12th century, the Roman Catholic Church was the most powerful political institution in Europe, with archbishops and bishops wielding as much power as dukes and earls, often serving as senior ministers in the governments of kings and queens. However, in the middle of the 11th century, this power of the church had led to clashes across Europe between rulers like the Holy Roman Emperors in Germany, or indeed Henry's father and brother in England over who had the right to appoint archbishops, bishops, and the abbots of leading monastic houses. Should the Pope in Rome and the archbishops within a country have the overall responsibility for this, or should a monarch have control over the appointment of senior church figures? This investiture controversy, as this clash between kings and popes is known, was still underway when Henry became King of England. Henry took an aggressive approach to resolving it, exiling the Archbishop of Canterbury, Anselm, in 1105. He also appears to have commissioned a series of anonymous treatises known as the York Tracts, or Tractatus Eboracensis, to discuss the legalities of the matter in a way which reflected well on the rights of the crown over the church. Eventually, these efforts resulted in a compromise, the Concordat of London of 1107, whereby Henry agreed to allow the Pope in Rome to invest the bishops and abbots of dioceses and religious houses across England, but those who were so appointed would also have to swear an oath of homage to the crown for the lands which they would come into possession of. In this way, Rome would maintain considerable control over the right of appointment or investiture, but these figures would also owe substantial loyalty to the crown as ecclesiastical lords. The Concordat of London eventually became the basis for agreements between the Pope and other European rulers to resolve the investiture crisis, but tensions would continue over the respective powers of the crown and the church for the remainder of the 12th century. Henry inherited an unstable situation on his western border. The Normans had made some efforts to conquer Wales as part of the Norman conquest of 1066 and the years that followed. Indeed, the conqueror, Henry's father, had granted some of his foremost followers lands in the West Midlands and the March region with the explicit goal of having them reduce the power of the Welsh lords and extend Norman control into Wales. This goal had been furthered to a large extent in the 1070s, but the outbreak of hostilities amongst William's sons in the aftermath of his death had set the policy of conquering Wales back. Thus, it was not until Henry's reign that a proactive policy could be implemented again. In 1108, Henry campaigned into South Wales in an effort to force the lords there to submit to Norman rule. He met with considerable success, establishing Norman control over the region around Pembroke. However, despite years of further campaigning, the Welsh lords, particularly in the more mountainous regions of the north in Denbyshire and other locales, remained obstinately independent. This led Henry to reach an accommodation with them in the mid-1110s, whereby they expressed nominal loyalty to him, but maintained a great degree of effective independence. Yet Robert's detention at Cardiff in the 1120s and early 1130s clearly points to a certain degree of influence throughout Wales for Henry in the latter stages of his reign. Meanwhile, Henry strengthened the March region along the English-Welsh border, Wales would remain an area of contested Norman rule for centuries to come, only being fully brought under English rule from the late 13th century onwards, a century and a half after Henry's own time. Further to the north, Henry's father had also sought to extend Norman control into Scotland, though this had proved too ambitious at the time. Henry would not seek to emulate him as his marriage to Matilda in 1100 had effectively led him to ally with the Scottish royal family. This arrangement held for many years, even through a succession of new kings in Scotland, which included Matilda's brother, Alexander I, from 1107 to 1124. Henry further strengthened his alliance with Alexander around the time of his succession in Edinburgh by marrying one of his illegitimate daughters, Sibylla of Normandy, to Alexander. Hence, a firm alliance between England and Scotland prevailed for much of Henry's reign. Furthermore, when Alexander died in 1124, Henry aided his brother, and thus Henry's brother-in-law, David, to press his claim against a rival for power in the shape of male Colwyn, Mac Alexander, an illegitimate son of Alexander's who had obtained extensive support in the Scottish Isles and Highlands. Henry sent aid to David throughout a near ten-year war. In return, in later years, even after Henry's death, David supported the claim of Henry's daughter Matilda to succeed him as Queen of England. 
Overall, the relations between England and Scotland during Henry's reign were a model of harmony not regularly seen between the two nations during the High Middle Ages or late medieval period. Henry has the distinction of most likely establishing what was England's first zoo. This was established at Woodstock in Oxfordshire, a royal retreat which had acted as the location where King Alfred the Great had allegedly translated the consolations of philosophy by the late Roman philosopher Boethius two centuries earlier. There was little development here to speak of prior to Henry's time, but it was royal hunting land. It was here that Henry ordered the enclosure of the royal park with a wall around 1110. Then, inspired perhaps by his knowledge of zoos which had been created in Spain and other parts of Europe, he began filling the enclosure at Woodstock with exotic animals brought from afar. These included lions, porcupines, camels, and even some tigers. That animals of these kinds could be acquired and brought to England was perhaps not as unusual as it might first appear. After all, this was the age of the Crusades, and there were many ships crossing the Mediterranean every year between the trading republics in Italy and the new Crusader states in the Levant. As such, the trade in exotic animals brought from Asia and Africa was relatively common. However, it appears to have been Henry who first decided to place these in England into what we would call a zoo in modern terms. Throughout these years of reforming the government of England and addressing the clashes with the church, Henry was still troubled periodically by unrest in Normandy and in his other possessions in northern France. This was brought about in large part by the accession of Louis VI as King of France in 1108 and his determination to expand French royal control over his feudal lords, of which the Duke of Normandy was nominally one, although it had been a long time since any French monarch had been strong enough to attempt to demand the homage of a ruler of Normandy. This challenge from the French crown was compounded by the threat posed by several other neighbouring lords, such as the Count of Anjou, Fouc V. In order to counter these forces, Henry courted the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry IV, offering to marry his daughter Matilda to the Emperor's son, also named Henry, the latter of whom eventually succeeded his father as Holy Roman Emperor with the title of Henry V in 1111. With this, the English king acquired an alliance with arguably the most powerful ruler in Christendom, a boon to his efforts to maintain control over Normandy and his French territories in the 1110s and 1120s. While his alliance with the imperial family in Germany strengthened Henry's position in France, Normandy was never peaceful for long. Minor revolts arose frequently during the 1110s, but the most dangerous came about in 1115, when King Louis of France began promoting the claim of William Clito, a son of Henry's brother Robert, and thus Henry's nephew, to succeed as Duke of Normandy. This claim, which was a useful tool for the French king to extend his control over the north of France, was backed by numerous other prominent lords of the region, notably the Count of Flanders in Belgium and elements within the County of Anjou to the southwest of Normandy. War ensued between Henry and the French, Flemish and Angevin, it would continue for several years, through the latter half of the 1110s, with Henry mounting campaigns to France in 1117 and 1118. These ended in stalemate, but the situation changed considerably in 1119, when Henry convinced Count Fouc of Anjou to change sides and then won a considerable victory over the French at the Battle of Bremul on the 20th of August that year. With this, the war began to wind down. And early the following year, Henry reached an agreement with King Louis of France, whereby the conflict ceased, and Louis agreed to acknowledge Henry as Duke of Normandy and his son as his successor in that position, in return for Henry paying homage to Louis as King of France. The complex politics of the 1110s were rendered even more so by Henry's complex family life. He and his wife Matilda did have children, but they were few in number. A girl named Matilda after her mother was born in 1102, just over a year after their marriage. A boy named William Edelan followed in the early autumn of 1103. It has been speculated that a third child, a boy named Richard, was still born in the summer of 1101, but this does not seem credible given that Matilda was born in February 1102. In any event, what this meant is that Henry had only one legitimate son after many years on the throne. There was, though, no shortage of illegitimate children sired by him. 
In total, it is speculated that he had at least 20 illegitimate children from the early 1090s onwards. Of these, there were a roughly even mix of girls and boys, though slightly more daughters. The mothers of many of these illegitimate children are unknown in many instances, though some are known. For instance, Henry certainly sired children through a relationship with Lady Sibylla Corbett of Alcester in the 1090s, though in some instances all we have is a first name to go on, such as his mistress Edith. Yet, as numerous as these illegitimate children were, under the strictures of canon and common law at the time, they could not succeed Henry. Only a child born in wedlock could. Therefore, Henry's hopes of a smooth succession rested on his legitimate children, and in particular, on William, his only legitimate son. Henry's complex marital life and family tree might not have become an issue had William Edlin survived, but in the winter of 1120, one of the most infamous events in 12th century English and Norman history upended the line of succession. This was the White Ship Incident. Throughout the century and a half following the Norman Conquest, William the Conqueror, his successors, and the royal family and nobles maintained a steady stream of traffic across the English Channel. The kings of England, after all, were also the Dukes of Normandy in many cases, and they needed to be regularly present in both of their dominions. As such, Henry and other members of his family and the nobility made dozens of trips across the English Channel during their lifetimes. One such occasion was in late November 1120, when Henry, his son and heir William, several of his illegitimate children, and a large contingent of the Norman nobility had been in Normandy. The court was returning to England on the 25th of November 1120, when it was determined that the king's ship and other boats were insufficient to ferry everyone back to southern England. Accordingly, a newly fitted vessel, captained by Thomas Fitzstephen, a mariner whose father had captained the ship which delivered William the Conqueror over the channel in 1066, was requisitioned for the task. Known as the White Ship, it would go down in history for sowing chaos in 12th century England. Henry left Normandy aboard his own vessel on the fateful day in November 1120. However, according to Orderic Vitalis, who provides the most detailed account of events, his son and heir, William Edlin, and two of his illegitimate children, Matilda Fitzroy and Richard of Lincoln, along with several senior English and Norman lords, boarded the White Ship. Several members of the party were drunk, and William insisted on bringing wine on board ship. Then, as they prepared to depart, the party determined that they could make it back to England before the other ships, and commanded the captain to make all haste across the channel. It was a fateful decision. As the ship left port in the darkness, it struck a submerged rock in the harbour near Barfleur and began to sink. William apparently managed to make it to a small boat, but he tried to rescue his half-sister in the ensuing chaos and drowned along with her and his half-brother Richard, as did virtually everyone else. According to Vitalis, of the 300 people on board ship, only one, a butcher from Rouen, survived. The white ship was a disaster for Henry, upending the line of succession and ensuring that in decades to come, England and Normandy would be cast yet again into civil war. With the death of William Edler, Henry's reign suddenly entered a period of crisis from which it would never fully emerge. Henry did have a surviving legitimate child, but this was his daughter Matilda. Although England did not follow the Salic law, an ancient Frankish law which was followed in France and prohibited women from succeeding to the French throne, it was nevertheless extremely difficult to imagine the political community of England accepting Matilda as queen during a period when kingship was as much about being a leader on the field of battle as an effective administrator. Moreover, it became apparent in the early 1120s that many would not accept Matilda, a fact borne out by the outbreak of several rebellions across England and the Welsh border in the early 1120s as Henry's subjects stressed their independence. Yet. Henry was undaunted. He was determined that if he did die without any other legitimate children, that Matilda would succeed him. Stressing that she had married Henry V, the Holy Roman Emperor, in 1114, and that their marriage placed England and Normandy in a favourable alliance. Yet even this was scuppered in 1125, when the Emperor died prematurely. 
Yet, Henry quickly responded by negotiating a new marriage between Matilda and Geoffrey, heir to the county of Anjou to the south of Normandy in France. Through this arrangement, Henry sought to argue that Geoffrey would be associated with Matilda as king consort if she became queen. In this way, he hoped to sell the idea of Matilda succeeding him to the English nobility. This was not Henry's only strategy. He was also seeking to produce another legitimate male heir in the 1120s after the White Ship disaster. Henry's first wife, Matilda of Scotland, had died on the 1st of May 1118, still shy of her 40th birthday. Henry had not remarried immediately, but in the aftermath of the White Ship, he determined to do so. There had already been tentative negotiations to this effect between Henry and Count Godfrey I of Louvain for the English king to marry Godfrey's daughter, Adeliza. These were expedited in the aftermath of the White Ship, and on the 24th of January 1121, Henry, at approximately 54 years of age, married 18-year-old Adeliza. However, despite the fact that there is evidence to suggest that Adeliza travelled extensively with Henry between England and Normandy in the 1120s and early 1130s, perhaps to improve the possibility of conception, no child resulted from the union. This is somewhat peculiar, as Henry was certainly not sterile, as his number of illegitimate children amply demonstrates, while Adeliza would go on in later years to have children during her second marriage after Henry's death. But what this meant during Henry's lifetime is that all of his hopes of a direct succession rested on his daughter Matilda. This situation brought fresh challenges in the last decade or so of Henry's reign, one of the possible avenues of concern when it came to the now contentious succession was the possibility that either Henry's brother Robert might become a focus of conspiracy yet again or, more likely, his son William Clito, who was born in 1102 and was an adult by medieval standards by the time of the White Ship. Indeed, Henry's nephew had already been a fulcrum for opposition to Henry in the 1110s. Robert remained under arrest and would remain so until his death at roughly 80 years of age in 1134. But William was another matter. Following the White Ship, he became a renewed focus of conspiracy among certain Norman lords who were unhappy with Henry's reign and his promotion of the new men. Consequently, in 1123, they began plotting a new rebellion, one which gained strength from proposed plans by Count Fulk V of Anjou to marry his daughter Sibylla to William Clito and give him a toehold in the county of Maine as her dowry. Henry managed to successfully appeal against the marriage as a breach of canon law, but William nevertheless remained a problem during the mid-1120s, particularly so from March 1127, when he succeeded to the significant title of Count of Flanders, in what is now Belgium. Using this position, and a powerful alliance of French and Flemish lords, he made war on Henry in Normandy in 1127 and 1128, but it ultimately proved to be his undoing. While laying siege to the town of Aust in the summer of 1128, he suffered a wound to his arm, which turned gangrenous and led to his death on the 28th of July. Without any son and heir, the threat which William and his line posed to Henry died out, though his death did nothing to solve the wider succession problem. Henry's last years were spent primarily trying to prepare England and Normandy for the succession. In 1128, Matilda married Geoffrey of Anjou as a precursor to succeeding her father. Their position was strengthened when Geoffrey's father, the Count of Anjou, left France altogether to head to the Crusader States in the Holy Land, leaving Geoffrey as the new Count. Yet their marriage was problematic, as Matilda did not get along with her new husband, and they often spent considerable periods of time apart, tensions which were known to the wider political community and which threatened the succession resolution which Henry was aiming to implement. Things improved in the early 1130s after a reconciliation between Matilda and Geoffrey in 1131, and much to Henry's satisfaction, Matilda gave birth to two sons, Henry and Geoffrey, in 1133 and 1134 the older of whom, known as Henry Fitz Empress, on account of Matilda having formerly been the wife of the Holy Roman Emperor, would potentially succeed Matilda one day. The presence of a grandson strengthened the possibility that the political community in England and Normandy would accept Henry's succession arrangements 
and Matilda as queen after he died. As such, Henry had some reasons to be confident of a peaceful succession in his last years. This was the scenario which largely pertained at Henry's death. His demise has a colorful aspect to it. According to Henry of Huntingdon, a contemporary of Henry's who was alive at the time of the king's death, the king died from eating too many lampreys, a kind of freshwater eel fish as related by the chronicler in his Historia Angolorum, or History of the English. The king's health is said to have deteriorated in the days which followed his gluttonous feast of fish, and he eventually died on the 1st of December 1135 at Saint-Denis-en-Lyon in Normandy, aged around 66 or 67. While one would be forgiven for dismissing as fanciful Huntington's claim that it was an excessive meal of fish which killed the king, it has been speculated by historians in recent years that there may have been some truth to this and that Henry met his end owing to ptomaine poisoning, an excess of amino compounds which can result from eating food contaminated by bacteria. Whatever the truth of it, whether fish or sheer old age claimed the king, we do know that his funeral was held in northern France with his body taken to Rouen, the ancestral home of the Dukes of Normandy. There, his entrails were removed and buried at the Priory of Notre Dame du Pré before his body was taken across the Channel to England and buried at Reading Abbey. Despite his efforts to ensure a peaceful succession after he was gone, England and Normandy soon descended into a period of conflict known as the Anarchy. The English nobility was unwilling to accept a female ruler, and despite Matilda having been designated by Henry as his successor, many of the leading nobles of the realm quickly sided with Henry's nephew, Stephen of Blois, the son of Edella, Henry's sister, when he put forward a claim to succeed Henry just days after the old king's death. Yet not everyone was willing to show such disloyalty to Henry's wishes, and Matilda and her husband Geoffrey began building their own base of support in France, with which she invaded England in 1139 in an effort to overthrow Stephen and claim her rightful position as queen. Despite capturing Stephen in the early 1140s, he was soon released as part of a prisoner exchange, and the wars, both in England and northern France, continued on throughout the decade. Eventually, they began to focus on whether Stephen's son Eustace would succeed him as king, or Matilda's son, Henry Fitzempress. Eustace's death in 1153 paved the way for Stephen to accept Henry Fitzempress as his designated successor, and so, when Stephen died in 1154, Henry I's grandson finally succeeded as King Henry II, restoring much-needed order to England and Normandy in the process. Henry I was one of England's most unlikely kings. He was born around 1068, the youngest of eight children and four sons of William the Conqueror. Given that his older brothers were already nearing their adult years by that time, it was very unlikely that Henry would ever rise to become ruler of an extensive part of his father's dominions. And yet, the death of Richard, followed by the rivalry between Robert and William Rufus, allowed him to carve out a position for himself in northern France, aided by Robert's inept rule in Normandy and his subsequent decision to head on the First Crusade. All of these issues put Henry in prime position to succeed William Rufus when he died prematurely in 1100, though his death may not have been as accidental as it seems, and perhaps Henry had his older brother killed. As King Henry hewed his own path, he demoted many powerful individuals and promoted his own followers as the new men, while also expanding royal government and taxation. He also finally brought about an end to Robert's ambitions, imprisoning his own brother for several decades at the end of his life, a decision which has shaped Henry's reputation for cruelty to a significant extent. But while he might have successfully claimed complete control over his father's dominions by the 1110s, the disaster of the White Ship cast a pall over his reign as the succession became very unclear. Ultimately, Henry might be said to have succeeded in many ways throughout his life, but in the end, he could not fully impress on the English nobility the wisdom of accepting his daughter as queen when he was gone. The anarchy which followed ultimately overshadowed his reign. What do you think of King Henry I? Did he lend some much needed stability to the political situation in England after the tumultuous first decades of Norman rule? Or did he leave the country more unstable than he found it? 
please let us know in the comment section. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching.